Okay. Hello and welcome to Codex. Today's speaker is Harmony John from York University. Dr. John finished her PhD in 2018 at the University of Waterloo under the supervision of Chris Godsell. After that, she was a postdoctor, postdoctoral fellow at the University of Montreal. She is now York Science Fellow at York University. Dr. John studies algebraic graph theory and its applications for equiangular lines and quantum walks. Her 2016 paper, Equiangular Lines and Covers of the Complete Graph, elucidated the use of drakens for constructing equiangular type frames and sparked great interest in further applications of graph coverings for projective packings. We are very glad to have her here today to talk about this and related topics. So please take it away, Harmony. Thank you very much. I didn't know I did that much <laughs> in the 2016 paper, but yeah, so there will be one part of my talk. Um, so I will talk about the so-called jackets and their applications in, in two areas. Um, the first one is um, they give rise to sort of um, tight equiangular lines in a complex twin. Um, so this is a quite, actually quite old work, a joint work with uh, Gabriel, uh, Chris, and Mohammed in 2016. And so I guess some of you may have already heard about this part, so please lower your expectation. There's nothing new out of this. And the second part is uh, dragons are useful in generating quantum entanglement in quantum works. So that's uh, in a more recent project with um, other eight authors, and I will mention their names later. Okay, so the first part, I want to start with the problem that probably all of you have heard of. That is, um, in the vector space r to the d, pick some lines so that every two lines make the same angle. Then how many lines can we pick? So of course, if two lines are intersecting, then we have two choices for the angle. So I will go with the smaller one. And in other words, all I care about is, let's call these two lines x1 and x2. All I care about is the absolute value of their in a product. And also during this talk, I will assume all the lines are unit, so I don't have to worry about the denominator here to get the actual angle. Okay, so in R2, um, we can find three equiangular lines. And here's the way we take the hexagon and join its antipodes like this. Okay, and that gives us three lines whose coordinates are given here. So you can manually check that their inner product is plus minus one over two. And that shows these lines are equiangular. Okay, so in R3, um, we actually have six lines. So start with the icosahedron. It has two vertices, and I can play the same trick. So join the antipodal vertices, and then I will see six lines um, on the right-hand side. You can also manually check if you want that uh, their inner product is one over square root five in absolute value. Okay. So uh, we can actually generalize this concept to the complex vector space as well. So here, um, our core, my lines x1 through xn, and they are said to be equiangular if there is some constant alpha, um, which I should refer to as the angle, so that for any distinct pair of lines, the absolute value of their inner product is equal to alpha. So the question is, how big can this n be given the dimension d? Um, and here's the trick. We are going to associate each lie with a projection onto the space spent by the lie. So this is denoted by the capital Xi. And you will see this is actually a Hermitian matrix. So every lie gives rise to such a projection. And therefore, the number of such lies cannot exceed the dimension of Hermitian matrices over R over C. And that gives us the Gerson bound or the so-called absolute bound. So in the real case, uh, we are actually counting the um, 
symmetric matrices. And that has dimension d plus one choose two. So that is the upper bound of real acroangular lines. In the complex case, we are counting the Hermitian matrices. So the, the bound is a bit larger, which is d squared. Um, that is the first difference between these two bounds. They are not equal. And the other difference is in the real case, the bound cannot always be achieved. So as you can see in dimension four, uh, the Gerson bound predicts 10, but we can actually only achieve six. And it's more obvious if you look at this column. So from dimension seven to 13, this n is frozen at 28. But according to the Gerson bound, this should keep increasing. Okay. So it's actually conjectured that only in dimension one, two, three, seven, and 23 can this bound be that. But um, that hasn't been proved as far as I know. Now in the complex case, uh, we don't have this problem yet. Um, I think it's verified numerically uh, up to I guess, at least 67 for the dimension that um, this bound can always be a 10. So it, it was conjectured by Zona that uh, d squared, you can always find d squared lies in the d-dimensional complex vacuum space. Okay, so given such a lie, you may also wonder how small can this angle alpha be? And that is answered by the Welch bound or the relative bound. It's called relative because this bound depends on not only the dimension d here, but also the size of your set. And this equality holds if and only if the sum of all the projections we defined before is a multiple of the identity. In this case, we say um, these lines are tight or they form an equiangular tight frame. So um, a relative bound is a necessary condition for the absolute bound. Okay, so what do this ET, sorry, there's a typo, I think it should be ETF. Yeah, what do these ETFs have to do with graphs? If you think about how we construct the lines in two and three dimensional vector space, uh, the first one comes from a hexagon and the second one comes from a icosahedron. Both of them have a very natural underlying graphs. Right, so it would be very um, interesting to see if other ETFs also correspond to some abstract graphs. And this is actually very well understood and it was, um, there was a, a, a relation that's discovered decades ago. And the trick is to connect equiangular lines and graphs using this bridge, the cytomatrix matrix or um, signature matrix. So um, the tightness of, of the angular lines, which is a geometric condition, will now translate into um, the spectrum of the cytomatrix, matrix, which is an algebraic condition. And that will further impose conditions on the graphs. So uh, like distance regularity and antipodal. And that is a graph theoretic condition. And of course, you can go backwards in this diagram. Okay, so I will explain this using the um, R3 example. Here I have six lines. They are recorded in the matrix U. So each column is a line. And I normalize them by dividing um, everything by this number. So how do we test that these columns are equiangular? Well, you take the gram matrix, which is U transpose U. So in the diagonal, we expect to see the norm of every line, which should be one because we normalize them. And in the off diagonal entry, we expect to see the inner product between two different lines. So um, these inner products should have the same absolute value if all the lines are equiangular. And indeed, we can isolate from G a copy of this term. So one over root five will be the angle, and S is the cytomatrix matrix over here. It has zero diagonal, and the off diagonals are unimodular numbers plus minus one. So that shows the lines are actually equiangular. 
But this matrix says a lot more. If you compute its eigenvalues, you will see they are precisely two. So, um, oh, I don't know what happened. Um, root five with multiplicity three and the negative root five with multiplicity three. So that's the spectrum of this guy. And that translates into two eigenvalues for the ground matrix, which is two with multiplicity three and zero with multiplicity three. On the other hand, we know u transpose u and u u transpose, uh, they share the same non-zero eigenvalues. So that means two is an eigenvalue of this matrix with multiplicity three. But this is a three by three matrix. So means two, two is the only eigenvalue there. So actually u u transpose is a scalar multiple of identity, two times i. But hey, that's exactly what we mean by tightness using this projection language, right? So um, in other words, given a set of lines, they are um, tight if and only if the corresponding side of matrix has exactly two eigenvalues. Okay, um, so what can we do with the side of matrix? Well, it has zero plus minus one entries, so we can view it as a side adjacency matrix of the complete graph. Here the graph has six vertices, and it's weighted because, um, because the entries are plus minus one. So for the plus one edges, I will color them by black, and the minus one edges, I will color them by pink. From this coloring, we can blow it up to uh, uh, um, a weighted graph in the following way. So basically, I replace every zero by a block, a two by two block of zero, and I replace every one by uh, the two by two identity matrix, and I replace every minus one by this two by two permutation matrix. So in this way, I will get a, a matrix with twice the size. And what does that mean graph theoretically? Well, that means for every um, vertex, I blow it up to two isolated vertices. Like this, okay. And um, if there is a black edge, then I replace it by a parallel matching between, between these two um, cohics. So they are called the fibers. And if there's a pink edge, then I replace it by a cross matching like this. So the resulting graph is called the double cover of the graph. There is a homomorphism from the larger graph to the smaller graph, which is locally bijective. Okay, so here um, is, is the result. Um, I, I stole this picture from Gabriel's slides because uh, I cannot reproduce his, his beautiful drawing. But you can see like every vertex uh, has, has a fiber and then there's some matrix between them. But I can redraw this graph so that it looks more like the, the, the icosahedron we started with. And that's not a coincidence. If you play the same trick with the uh, three lines in R2, you will get back to the uh, six cycle, which is underlying of online graph of the hexagon. And there are many nice properties of this graph. First of all, it's distance regular. So you can check it by looking at the distance partition of the graph relative to a vertex. So here I give you an example. Um, this is the distance partition relative to the red vertex. So the green ones are its neighbors. The blue ones are and those at distance two from the red one, and the purple is at maximum distance. And each color class here induce a regular graph. Every two color classes induce a biregular graph. So you can check this holds not only um, relative to this vertex, but also to the, all the other vertices and all the parameters um, does not depend on which one you start with as the first class. So that shows this graph is actually distance regular. And the second property is the graph has diameter three. So for distance regular graph, this means it has exactly four eigenvalues. And that's um, gonna tell us something about the cytomatrix. 
Uh, finally, the graph is antipodal, um, which means being at maximum distance is an equivalence relation. Or in other words, if you go into the last class in your distance partition, and if there were any other vertices here, then they must be at maximum distance from each other. Of course, in this example, we only have one vertex. So um, this condition is vacuously satisfied. Okay, so from a set of tight equilibrium lines, we get a nice distance regular antipodal cover of K6. What about the converse? Well, if we have a double cover, then we can write out its adjacency matrix in this block form, right? This is not a problem. Now notice that all these two by two blocks commute with each other. So I can simultaneously diagonalize them. So let's say they have a common eigenbasis um, in, in the columns, let's see, of a two by two matrix P, then I can pre and post multiply this whole matrix by this. P inverse, P inverse, you have six copies of them. Okay, so this is a similarity transformation. And after that, we will get another block matrix where each block is actually diagonal. So these are the eigenvalues of the original block relative to P. Okay. And now I want to um, highlight these entries in a different way. So here I will look at all the one one entries of these two by two blocks and color them by yellow. And the two two entries will be colored by green. So after some permutation, I push all the yellow entries to the top left corner and the green to the bottom right. So this, this yellow block is precisely the JSON matrix of my K6. Okay, on the other hand, this green block is precisely the Seidel matrix. Okay, and um, using a relation between Seidel matrix, gram matrix, and U, uh, you can like, rec recover the underlying equilibrium lines. And because um, we start with uh, antipodal cover with exactly four eigenvalues, that means the Seidel matrix will contribute exactly two eigenvalues here. Let me call it Sigan Tau. Um, this complete graph will contribute to two other eigenvalues, and minus one, and minus one. These four will be distinct from each other. So the lines you get are actually tight. Okay, so in summary, um, every equiangular frame corresponds to a double cover of Km, and they, they are linked by the side matrix. Moreover, the frame is tight if and only if side matrix has exactly two eigenvalues, if and only if this double cover has exactly four eigenvalues. So this picture is sort of complete. Now the question is what happens to the complex line? Can we also associate each complex ETF with some covering graph? And that turns out to be a much harder problem because given the angle alpha, there are infinitely many complex numbers that has alpha as an absolute value, right? Well, in the, in the real case, you only have plus minus, two choices. So um, if we don't impose any condition on the complex lines, then we're gonna lose control over the inner products and we cannot see anything in general. So to solve that, I'm gonna specialize to the case where all the inner products are rules of unity. So at least we have a finite underlying group to play with. Um, the other problem with this generalization is, uh, what do we do with the double cover? Of course, we can now replace each vertex by more than two vertices and um, join them using matching. But now, in order to mimic the previous simultaneously diagonalizable trick, we need to assume all these blocks commute with each other. And that is not true in general when, when, when r is greater than, greater than or equal to three. So here we have to assume something more for our um, generalized cover. Okay, so let me define the r cover using this arc function. 
Um, given the complete graph on n vertices, an arc function of index r um, is a function from the arcs. So every edge is replaced by two directions. These are called the arcs or directed edges. So f is function from the arcs to the symmetric, symmetric group on r symbols. And we insist that the image of one direction is the inverse of the image of the other direction. And an arc function is normalized if it's the identity on some spanning tree. So in this example, we see that um, this is a spanning tree of the complete graph. And it's normalized because every edge is black. OK, so from an arc function, we can easily construct an arc fold cover. Replace every vertex by the symbol 1 through r. OK, and this image, fuv, it determines the permutation on, on the R symbols. So it gives us some matching. Um, I will just draw them arbitrarily. Something like this. OK, so this is called an R fold cover of Kn. Now, once we define the cover using this arc function, we can infer a lot of properties of the graph using the group generated by the image of f. For example, um, suppose the function is normalized over a spanning tree, then uh, we can determine whether the cover is connected or not. Actually, it's connected even only if the group um, of the arc function acts transitively on the R symbols. Now, given the connected cover, we can also look at the group of automorphisms that uh, fixes each fiber. So it can permute the, the R symbols inside fiber, but it cannot um, map one of them to, to some vertex in the other fiber. So let G denote this group. We have that G acts semi-regularly on the fibers. So that means the size of G is at most the size of the fiber. Moreover, this group is regular if and only if the group generated by the images of our function is regular. And in this case, we have F is isomorphic to G. And that will be the case we are interested in. If F is regular, um, then we could X an abelian cover if F is in addition abelian. And correspondingly, if F is cyclic, then we say X is a cyclic cover of Kn. Um, so yeah, actually I want to say a bit more. So uh, because F is regular, you can actually compute the adjacency matrix by filling in some blocks. So the block, the diagonal blocks will be zeros and the, the off diagonal blocks will be the regular representation of, of your FUV. So suppose this is the block index by U and B. And in the block indexed by B and U, you will see P inverse. Okay. Um, so that is uh, what the adjacency matrix looks like. If the cover is a billion, then all those blocks are simultaneous diagonalizable. So again, we have AX is similar to this um, block diagonal matrix. And each of them is determined by a linear character of this group. So without loss of generality, we may assume phi 1 is the identity map. So here, the first block gives us the recency matrix of Kn. And all the other blocks will be cytomatrices. So how do we get a cytomatrix that has exactly two eigenvalues? Well, there's a theorem that says X is distance regular and antipodal if and only if there is a constant C so that all these remaining blocks are co-spectral to each other and have exactly two eigenvalues that are determined by this constant C. So that is a very strong result and I think this is due to Chris and Hensel. 
And such a cover is called an abelian an RC dragon. So just to remind you what these symbols mean, R is, sorry, yeah, R is the size of fiber and N is the size of the underlying complete graph and C is the number of common neighbors of two vertices at distance two. Okay, so what this says is we have actually two pieces of information. If X is a, um, a billion curve of Kn, then we are going to get a bunch of equiangular frames. If in addition, this cover is distance plus regular, then all these frame, uh, all these, uh, frames is gonna be tight because of this eigenvalue condition. So that is one direction we established in our paper, every abelian dragon determines an ETF. And that shows one implication here. For the other direction, uh, it's, it's a bit more difficult because from a set of lines, we get only one set of block, but to recover the, the abelian cover of KN, we need other blocks. And when will those blocks be co-spectral to this one? And how will the entries you obtain from each other using the field automorphism? That's not very clear unless we assume um, something about the rules of unity. So and that's what we do. We actually assume um, the equal angular lines have a piece rules of unity as their inner products, where P is a prime. So here's an example. In dimension three, there are nine equal angular lines. And you can take the gram matrix, subtract it by identity, and scale everything down by the, the angle. And that gives me this side of matrix. And here the entries are all third rows of unity. You can actually view this as an arc function. So every entry indexed by UNV will be the image of um, the arc UV under the arc function. So they actually form a cyclic group. And given that we can blow up this nine by nine matrix to a 27 by 27 matrix using the image under the regular representation. So I'm gonna send every zero to a block of zeros and send I to, send one to the identity and send omega to the sort of a cyclic matching and send omega squared to the other cyclic matching. And that will be the adjacency matrix of a three-fold abelian cover of K9. Now, by our previous result, we know that this adjacency matrix AX is similar to that block diagonal matrix. And uh, um, in particular, these linear characters are defined in this form. So if you plug in K equals one, this is really just A of K9. And if you plug in K equals two, then we recover the cytomatrix matrix that we started with, the, the nine by nine matrix. And the third one can be obtained from the second by um, raising everything to the second power. So we do have two cycle blocks. The problem is to show that this actually gives us a dragon. And record the theorem that says a cover is dragon if and only if all these blocks, except for the first one, are co-spectral and have this corresponding minimum polynomial. So this is what we are going to show. We will prove S phi two and S phi three, they are co-spectral. And that breaks into two steps. Step one is to show they have the same eigenvalues and step two is to show the eigenvalues have the same uh, they have the same eigenvalues with the same multiplicities. In the first step, we notice that if M is a minimum polynomial of the first side of block, then when we evaluate it at S, all the entries, they are polynomials in omega. And because this is equal to zero, that means this polynomial is divisible by the cyclotomic polynomial. Now what happens if we plug in S53? Well, 
we simply apply that field automorphism to these entries. And it turns out this part will still remain the cyclotomic polynomial. So M, this minimum polynomial will also annihilate S by three. That shows they have the same eigenvalues. For the multiplicities, notice that the trees of S and S53 are both zero. So we can write two equations about the multiplicities, which will uniquely determine them. So that proves why um, S and S53 are actually co-spectral. And that proof can be generalized to any prime P. So here's the result. Given any equilateral tight frame uh, where the inner products between two lines are piece of of unity, we can construct a cyclic p-fold jacket. And that completes this direction. So um, in our paper, we also consider what happens to the Gerson bound and we uh, actually find some feasible parameters and claim that if those abelian jacket exist, then it will give us a set of equilateral lines that meets the absolute bound. But then uh, recently, I think there was a paper by uh, Joy and Dustin that showed none of this will work. So in terms of the, the, the absolute bound, the jackets are just hopeless. But um, they also generalize this idea to a so-called rule lines and rule graphs. And I think there might be some chance of obtaining um, equivalent lines with maximum size. But for any questions about this part generalization, please, please ask the organizers. Okay, so um, that is the first part. I still have some time, I guess, to discuss about the second application. So um, the jackets are also useful in generating the so-called quantum fractional revival or entanglement in quantum work. And for those who are not familiar with the quantum works, I will um, explain them using the smallest example, P2. On two vertices. So here we have the adjacency matrix, which is just a two by two permutation matrix. Okay. And, uh, a quantum work in the most abstract sense is just this matrix. It's the exponential of i times t times a, where t is a real number that denotes the time. So you can expand this as an infinite series here. And for our particular P2 example, notice that every even power of a is equal to identity and every odd power of A is equal to A itself. So this is really just two terms, some multiple times I plus some multiple times A. And using calculus, you can figure out these coefficients. They are, they are respectively cosine T and I sine T. So here we get a concrete expression of UT. And you can manually check this is a unitary matrix. But in general, when you take the exponential of I times the Hermitian matrix, you will always get something unitary. Okay, so that determines the evolution of a quantum work on P2. Now the mixing matrix as defined here, it tells you um, the outcome when you stop the system at time T and perform a measurement. So basically it converts every unit column in UT to a probability distribution. So if I start with vertex one, then at time t, I'm going to see vertex 1 with probability cosine squared. And I may see vertex 2 with probability sine squared. Okay. So um, let's plug in some special time to see what happens. At time pi over 2, this is my transition matrix. And this is my mixing matrix. So it says with certainty, the quantum worker moves from vertex one to vertex two at this time. This is called perfect state transfer. And it's very useful in transmitting information across a quantum network. Let's plug in another time pi. Then we see something that is a multiple of identity. So 
um, the physical meaning is that the, the system now returns to the original state. So if the quantum worker starts with one at this time, it's back to one. Okay, so both of these phenomena are interesting, but quite rare among the graph. Um, if you randomly pick a graph, you're not gonna expect any of them to happen. Now let's look at a slightly larger example, the path of four vertices. This is its adjacency matrix. Okay, we can no longer play the same trick because no integer power of A is um, a multiple of identity. But we can still write this um, as a finite sum using the spectral decomposition of A. So we know the path um, of four vertices has four eigenvalues, which takes this form. And for the trace eigenvalue, I will let E sub J denote the orthogonal projection onto the trace eigenspace. And then um, this product sum to the JSON symmetrics of A, and this is simply due to the eigen projection. But now once I have this decomposition, for every function in A, to evaluate it at A, I only need to evaluate it at all these eigenvalues, and this identity will still hold. So in particular, this transition matrix um, as a function in A, it can be evaluated in the following way. We take the exponential of it times um, the eigenvalue and then multiply it by ej. This is going to sum to u of t. So let's plug in t equals 2 pi over root 5 into this equation. You will see that while the, the columns, they do not concentrate on only one entry like we saw on P2, they do concentrate on only two vertices. And one of them is the vertex you start with. So for example, here in this column, you will see some non-zero entries in first column and some non-zero entry in the last column. And this is what we call fractional revival. The physical meaning behind this is that the two cubes represented by vertex one and four are in entanglement. So, um, yes, yeah, so that is fractional revival. Um, we can generalize all the previous phenomenon into the so-called K fractional revival. And here K is a subset of your vertex set. When we say there's KFR at time t, if after permutation, we can write my transition matrix in this block form. So one of the block is indexed by the vertices in K. So for example, um, when K is equal to two, as we have already seen, P2 and P4 um, have FR, and P3 also have FR, actually it has a perfect state transfer. And in the cycles, C4 and C6 are the only, only examples that have two fractional revival. The cocktail party graphs will also have KFR. Um, so are the hypercubes and many, many graphs in the association schemes. So for more information, please check two of our papers on fractional revival. In that paper, uh, we also develop many um, graph theoretic conditions for, for the graph to admit a pair of FR vertices. So there are conditions like the vertices must be fractionally co-spectral, uh, which is a generalization of co-spectrality, and they must be parallel, things like this. But it actually took a while um, before we start thinking about the more general K-fractional revival when K is greater than two, and partly because uh, the physicists haven't published anything relevant when K is big, so we didn't think there might be anything meaningful at that time. And the other reason is we also didn't have many examples to play with when K is not true. But we do have the theory, and it's quite easy to characterize KFR using the spectral decomposition. So, if you remember, we can write ut in this form. But this is not really the spectral decomposition of ut because for two different theta r's, 
they make response to the same exponential. So it will be safer to say this is a refinement of the spectral decomposition. And I will write the actual spectral decomposition on the right hand side. Sum of s, um, alpha s, fs. So alpha s will be a distinct eigenvalue of up. So it will take one of these values here. And given that fs will be the sum of er over all r's so that e to the it theta r is equal to alpha s. Okay, so now if all these fs are in the correct block diagonal form, let's say they all look something like this, then as the weighted sum of them, ut must also be in this block form. So a sufficient condition for fr to happen is to ask all fs to have this form. Conversely, it's well known that these eigenprojections fs are polynomials in ut. So if ut is in the block form, then so will all these fs. Okay, so that's what we do in this theorem. We showed KFR occurs if and only if there is a partition of the eigenvalues so that within each class, the eigenprojections sum to the correct block form, block diagonal form actually. And uh, within each class, the eigenvalues also line up in this sense. Okay, so um, yeah, so we had we had this theorem for quite a while. We just didn't have a chance to apply it to larger k. So last year, about the same time, Ada and I went to uh, the AMS in Madison, and I remember we had a long transit summer in some airport. I don't remember where it is, but I do remember it, it was very long that we actually start working together. So we we were trying to figure out some other things about k fractional revival. And then I opened my notebook um, and it was open to, to the wrong page with this, this suspicious expression. And all of a sudden we, we, we start wondering what happens to the dragons. Can there be K fractional revival on it? And it turns out this is a very natural class of graphs to look at because dragons are distance regular. So they live in some association scheme. Okay. And that means every function in the Jason's matrix, including the transition matrix, must be a linear combination of these matrices. Now, if the, if the distance regular graph is also antipodal, then one of these matrix will have a block diagonal form, where each block is indexed by the fibers. So all we need to do is make sure there's some t so that u of t is just a scalar model of, of this guy. And it turns out this expression is also useful because when you exponentiate both sides, they are still similar. So if I take exponential of i t of this matrix, then that's gonna be similar to exponential of these two blocks. Okay, now if this is in the correct block diagonal form, then that means this matrix on the right hand side must look something like this. Um, you are gonna see two non-zero entries in the first row and all the others will be zero. And similarly for the first column, and this. Okay, but this will happen only if both these two matrices are periodic at the same time, right? Because this is a decomposable matrix. You, you, for this to happen, um, you must have something non zero here, then everything is zero along the whole line and the column. So, in other words, um, fractional revival on dragons. Um, boils down to periodicity on these saddle blocks. And we know how to handle periodicity. You just check some very simple number theoretic condition on their eigenvalues. Indeed, um, during that trip, we find some three-fold covers that have k-fractional revival. 
And later in the paper, we use our previous results to prove that there are two infinite families of Jack and that do have this property. And um, here is the sketch of a proof. We know that Jacken has exactly four higher values. Two of them are contributed by Kn. And the other two have this um, expression. Moreover, um, if you compute the eigenspaces, you will see that these two eigenspaces corresponding to theta 1 and theta 2, they sum up to the block form, where each block is a scalar multiple of the all ones matrix. And the other two eigenspaces, they sum up to this block form. Okay, so the first condition about the eigenspaces lining up is satisfied. Moreover, if we pick the time to the pi over square root of n, then we will see that the, the, the condition about the eigenvalues lining up is also met. And that is basically the proof. Um, so before I finish, I just want to uh, quickly talk about another usage of Jackens. Um, so it's well known that perfect state transfer is monogamous, meaning that every vertex can only be involved in PST with at most one other vertex. So this, this is a faithful relation. Um, but uh, it may not be true in fractional revival. Actually, in our night author paper, we showed that there are weighted graphs so that uh, fractional revival is polygamous. Actually, you can engineer the weights so that between every pair of vertices, there is fractional revival. So it went way beyond monogamy, I think. But then we didn't know if the same thing can happen on our weighted graphs, so we posed that as an open question in the end of paper. And one month later, Xiao Hongzhang, who was, uh, who's currently a postdoc of Chris, she constructed some examples. Um, so there was, uh, I guess, an open question that has the shortest life. But then um, in the summer, Ada and I were supervising um, some URI students. And we were looking at Laplacian fractional arrival. So all we do is replace this A in the exponential by the Laplacian of adjacency matrix. There's also a corresponding physical model to this. So um, it was not clear whether we could have um, monogamy in the Laplacian model as well. But these students figured it out and using the Jacken construction. And I think the, the construction is quite neat, so I will explain it very quickly. Um, basically, you take the Cartesian product of two graphs, and the, the adjacency matrix of the product is given by the sum of the tensors. So because these two factors commute with each other, we have that it, the exponential of the big A is the product of the exponential of each of them. Tensor I tensor A Y. This is A X. Okay, so the transition matrix of the Cartesian product is the tensor product of two transition matrices of X Y. Now, if X, can you erase everything? Now, if X has fractional revival at time T, then this transition matrix is gonna have this form. And suppose at the same time, Y has periodicity. So you will have something on zero here and then everything else is zero along the same row and column. Then when you take the tensor product, we will still see a block in the top, okay? Um, conversely, if Y has FR at the same time, and X at the same time has a periodicity, then we'll see a different block that involves um, the first vertex. So this is basically the idea to create polygamy. And the students find out that um, if you take the double cover of K36 and using our knowledge about the eigenvalues, we have the minimum fractional revival time is pi over six, and the minimum periodicity time is pi over two. And you can do the same thing with the Hadamard graph of order 36 and get the corresponding numbers. Now the trick is to wait until the second time when fractional revival occurs. Because if you think about it, when you square a block diagonal matrix, it's still going to be block diagonal. So that means every integer multiple of this time is still going to be an FR time. 
And as long as it's not an integer multiple of this periodicity time, you will still remain entangled in. So it will not be the trivial identity case. So that means at time pi over three, the graph X is still FR. Well, at pi, time pi over two, the graph Y will still be in FR. And both of them are non-periodic. So then we can match them up and show that there is FR at time pi over two from vertex one to two, and there's FR at time pi over three from vertex one to three. So uh, I think I ran out of time, so I will stop there. Thanks. OK.